welcome to everybody to CSIS. Um, uh, I'm going to quickly turn over to Tony Carroll, who's a senior associate of the Africa program here at CSIS. But we're really delighted to be hosting Tom Burgess um, for uh, what we hope will be an <coughs> informal and interactive uh, chat about his new book, The Looting Machine. Um, Tom, thanks so much. And uh, Tony, thank you for um, directing Tom our way and for uh, moderating tonight's event. Um, I'll just collect the people from outside, but I think we'll, um, we'll go ahead and get started. Well, thanks, Jennifer. Um, and welcome to CSIS into Washington. You've arrived in that brief aperture that we have between winter and summer. Uh, so we've uh, certainly Washington doesn't get much more splendid than this from a standpoint of physical beauty. And here we are on the eve of, uh, of Earth Day, too. So we're, we're sort of talking about a topic that actually pertains a great deal to uh, the issue of, uh, of, the, of the global environment and Africa's uh, space therein. Uh, I want to thank Tom and welcome him for making uh, such a uh, terrific contribution to uh, providing thought leadership on an important uh, topic that we're all mulling over these days and the extent in which uh, Africa's future is tied to uh, the extractive sector and how governance is impacted by extractive industries and the f international financial institutions and new actors on the scene. And let me just start before I pose a few questions to Tom, and we'll leave plenty of room for Q&A because as Tom has suggested, that tends to be the best way in which we can really uh, uh, cover the waterfront on this, on this important topic. But I'd like to start with just a very uh, brief uh, read from the last, the concluding chapter of the book. Uh, and uh, if you don't mind, it's a very brief passage and I'll read it. The empires of colonial Europe and the Cold War superpowers have given way to a new form of dominion over the continent that serves as the mind of the world. New empires controlled not by nations, but by alliances of unaccountable African rulers governing through shadow states, middlemen who connect them with the global resources economy and multinational companies from East, West and the East that cloak their corruption in corporate secrecy. We prefer not to think of the mothers of Eastern Congo, the slum dwellers of Luanda and the miners of Merengue as we talk on our phones, fill our cars and propose to our lovers. As long as we go on choosing to avert our gaze, the looting machine will endure. Uh, the powerful words, powerful conclusion to a powerful book. Um, I'd like to maybe start on th to discuss what you and I, what drew you and I together uh, five or six years ago as you were reporting from Lagos, and that is the uh, issue of the collapse of the Nigerian textile industry. For, for those of you who don't know or follow the history of the Nigerian textile industry, um, at its peak, the Nigerian textile industry in the late 70s employed about 300,000 people. Uh, the, the product that was most distinctive in Nigerians' uh, uh, production was this wonderful wax, wax cloth that the African women adorned themselves throughout West Africa and was not only a, an industrial complex and vertical and uh, linkages to the agri sector in cotton production and ginning and processing and dyeing, but it was also an emblematic of the wonderful culture that Africa had because many of these designs were drawn from the rich traditions of Nigeria. They were often worn in symbolic ways to attend weddings and funerals uh, and other family events. And that industry, of course, is, is a, a shadow of what it once was. But it is a, an interesting lesson for how this industry uh, has collapsed, both from sort of external structural problems in the Nigerian economy, but also from internal political problems which I think Tom documents really in maybe the first or second chapter of your book. Mm -hmm. So why don't you draw a little bit, of, can we draw a little bit more about that, that story? You were reporting at that time from Lagos and, and uh, give us a little bit of indication, a little bit of the color of that story. Well, thanks, Danny, and thanks very much everyone for coming along. Um, that, that story of Nigerian textiles started for me when I'd only been in Nigeria for about a week and my editor sent me up to Kaduna. We were trying to do a special on the country and um, I, didn't, I, I had literally no idea what I was doing, but I turned up in, in Kaduna, was introduced through a couple of friends to various people, met one Muhammadu Bahari, who was um, made his views known, and um, started to go around some of the churches, it was actually, and the, and the sort of dilapidated old schools where a lot of these redundant textile workers were, um, were hanging out. It was a Sunday and they showed me the old, uh, the big factories in the middle of Kaduna by the, um, by the, walk, by the river, um, which were completely shuttered. Uh, there was one security guard on the inside and just lizards going in and out of the gates. And 
as you say, about 300,000 people, not just in Kaduna, but across northern Nigeria, would have been employed at the peak of the industry, and then many more indirectly in cotton farming and the rest of it. Um, and pretty quickly, I started to realize that the collapse of the textile industry is em emblematic of the collapse of northern Nigeria's economy and the creation of one of this enormous zone of poverty from what was a couple of decades ago a zone of relative prosperity. Um, and actually, the, f the first thread I followed, pardon the pun, um, is, wasn't to oil and the distortions. It was that these redundant workers who were standing around in an old school explaining to me how they'd lost their jobs, um, I said to them, so why, why has this happened? What's the root of this? And they, people shuffled and looked around, and they just said, Mangal. And I didn't know who this man was at the time, but um, over the years that followed, and in the book, I've tried to piece together the story of this guy, Al-Haji Dahuru Mangal, who is a big political donor. He funded Umar Ayyadwa's governorship campaigns and then presidential campaign. He's a big guy in the PDP, the, until recently the ruling party. Um, and he was also, uh, he ran the Hajj pilgrimage, he ran an airline, and he was also, behind all of this, one of the preeminent smugglers of um, northern Nigeria. He would truck in basically anything that anybody wanted. Textile imports are, are uh, illegal, um, and yet they completely dominate the market. Um, they have, I think, about 90% market share compared to the now withered local industry. Um, so I tried to piece together Mangal's story, but what also became clear was that he, he doesn't operate, he doesn't exist in a vacuum. He wasn't able to crush the Nigerian textile industry single-handedly. He needed Chinese counterfeiters. Um, he needed a porous border. But what he needed above all was the weakness of the domestic industry to be able to flourish. And that um, came about through the distortions caused by um, Nigeria's booming oil production through the 80s and 90s to start to this process known as Dutch disease, first identified in the Netherlands in the 50s when they struck gas. Of um, It primarily happens through the currency. I'm sure lots of people know this. Um, the currency becomes overvalued. Exports become um, uncompetitive. And at the same time, you get this insidious process in politics when, when governments start to become far more reliant on rent income from oil and nat other natural resources than they do on taxing the people and winning the consent of the people to rule, that public spending starts to shift away from infrastructure, roads, uh, a functioning electricity system, the education system, and into uh, what North Arawiwa calls a contractocracy, pouring that rent money out to win um, allegiance through patronage, um, and other and, and spending priorities that benefit the ruling elite. So military spending typically goes up enormously, um, and this this distortion in the exchange rate, the collapse of infrastructure, did for. Uh, or, or certainly started to um, cause enormous problems for this once flourishing Nigerian textile industry. So that's ultimately what I, what I was able to piece together and what, what, what the stories that others have told. Um, but the fascinating thing for me as a, as a final point is the extent to which, and I think often we miss this, the extent to which this kind of curse of natural resources is felt far from the oil slick creek to the delta or Eastern Congo with its mines, it, it permeates through, through the entire state, through the entire economy. Um, so much so that the northern Nigeria has felt the curse of oil arguably as much as the Delta in some ways. Indeed. Let's talk a little bit about some of these networks and how they emerge and out of uh, sort of in the shadows of, of these business dealings. And one remarkable uh, sort of theme or thread that runs through this book uh, is the involvement of the Queensway Group. They seem to be the universal donor to all the deals in which you talk about in your book. And I'd like us to hear a little bit more about Sam Pa, a lot about the Queensway Group, which of course isn't their actual name, but it's the name that was drawn based on their Hong Kong address mm -hmm. and the fact that many companies sort of resided there and at the end you talk about, or not reside there. Uh, but I'd like mm -hmm. to talk a little bit about how a, a person like Sam Pa is able to ingratiate himself in so many different areas and ways. It's really quite astounding. It is. Um, uh, the person who came up with the name is here, actually. It should be acknowledged, J.R. Mainly, He's done more than anyone to piece together um, what the Queensway Group is and how it works. And there's a, there's 
more coming from JR soon, uh, with which, for which, to which we're greatly looking forward. Well, and we'll have back for another session. Um, uh, so, what is Sam and how is he, he able to operate? Um, just a, yeah, a moment of background. He, as, as best we understand it, he was born either um, in Hong Kong or on the Chinese mainland and moved to Hong Kong as a young man. Um, gradually develops um, seemingly, the way I understand it, is a, a formal relationship with the Chinese intelligence services, but there also seems to be informal exchange of information. And then uh, he's, uh, he seems to have been involved in uh, arms dealing in Africa and elsewhere, in intelligence work in Cambodia, and um, in cultivating links between arms of the Chinese security and intelligence services and some of the African liberation movements but as they were preparing to take power or taking power. Um, and then, as like many spooks before him, um, he switched from espionage into business. There's a long line, obviously, of um, British Special Forces people um, hopping into the mining game in Africa instead. And Sam does this at exactly the time that Jiang Zemin decides to go forth into the world and sends out Chinese state-owned companies and entrepreneurs in search of natural resources and markets all over the world, but in, enormously so in Africa. And Sam is able to make himself, I think largely by sheer caprice, but partly by being in the right place at the right time, he's able to make himself someone who has, um, to borrow JR's term always, the right Rolodex. He's able to um, exaggerate his connections to some extent, both in Africa and China, but he's um, able to forge some of the parallel deals that go behind or underneath this big state-to-state -state relationship between um, uh, Beijing and various African countries. And he starts in Angola, um, where, and this is where the Queensway Group is born. It's a long story. I, I encourage you to read it in the book. But um, the, uh, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, Sam, with Manuel Vicente, Angola's Mr. Oil, um, is able to engineer a deal whereby a company is created called China Sonangol, which is Sam and his little group of allies registered at 88 Queensway in Hong Kong, um, and Sonangol, the kind of the engine of the, of, the, of the shadow state that controls Angola and controls its oil wealth. Um, that company ends up with various uh, stakes in some enormous um, oil fields. And Sam goes on to Zimbabwe to cut similar deals involving Mugabe's secret police and the diamond trade. He turns up when Dadis seizes power in Guinea. Um, I believe we have a, a daughter of the Republic of Guinea here who will be chipping in, I hope. Um, <laughs> I, I know she will. If she's yeah. already uh, um, queued. <laughs> and, and he's popped up all, in all manner of places. And there are two, I think, just two points to make. One is he operates in, he deals with, and this is a term I kept hearing, on my travels and postings. He deals with shadow states or parallel governments. He deals with the power that resides behind the formal institutions of state and which develops um, again and again when you have a country run on rent, on resource rent. Angola, Zimbabwe, Guinea under the junta. Um, they've, got, they've even got a foot into Nigeria um, and, and various other places beyond Africa now increasingly. Uh, that's one point. The other is that these are not the old, they're not the old networks. They're very much creatures of, Sam, I think, is very much a creature of globalization. These are business interests and private interests that harness state institutions, but don't necessarily represent them. So you, you, if you were to look at it in a sort of cartoonish way, you could see Sam as China, and China as a monolithic thing, coming in doing business with Africa, and seeing Africa as a monolithic thing. But these are enormous syndicates that stretch crucially through some of the um, pockets of the, fan, of, the, of the globalized economy where it's easiest to engage in corporate subterfuge, the BVIs, Cayman Islands, places like that. Um, it also involves, it equally involves business partners from East and West. So Sam will bring in some of the, big, the biggest Chinese companies and help them win contracts and advance his own private interest in that way. But the, the Queensway Group's biggest asset, this stake in, a, in one of the big um, offshore oil fields in Angola is run by BP. In, Glen, in Guinea, they have a, an offtake agreement with, with Glencore, and uh, they own assets ranging from real estate in Singapore to the JP Morgan building opposite the New York right. Stock Exchange. Right. 
Which, and that's one of, and, and it just gets more and more bizarre. I mean, some of this stuff you couldn't make up. So a Queensway asset was doubled as the Gotham City stock exchange in the last Batman film. Yeah. I mean, it does start to get fairly bizarre, some of this stuff. Well, I urge you to read the book because it's the, the thread that runs through it all is this. Uh, is, is Sam, yeah. Is Sam. Um, I, of course, taking a page from Tiny Roland and uh, uh, perhaps uh, Mark Rich and others who uh, were were, were those or used those same strategies to enrich themselves in two generations before. For sure. Uh, and oddly enough, uh, I, not Mark Richards had mentioned, but Glencore is, and of course, Tiny Roland still is, you know, I guess, the founder of Lonman going back many years. That's a so, great comparison, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think they knew how to play this game uh, well before. Uh, let's talk a little bit about you know, lost potential. And I'd like to draw you a little bit on the Simandu project, which okay. is a project uh, Tiggy and I were talking about earlier, I, I first went to Guinea in, in the 1980s, and they were talking about the promise of Simandu back then. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're still talking about the promise of Simandu, and it's still a very complicated uh, history. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about why the country of Guinea has not been able to benefit uh, from what is perhaps the, the most, the largest undeveloped uh, iron ore project in the world. Well, yeah, the, I mean, the, the chapter on the book about this is called, it borrows that old Swahili saying of when the elephants fight, the grass gets right. trampled. I think that is the, that's um, what has happened. There's, I'll just make two quick points on that, really, um, before seeding the floor. Um, one would be that, um, again, Simandu has been just tied up in layers of, um, in some cases, seemingly corruption, and in some cases of, the, the enormous mismatch between multinational, multinationals and a resource-rich but relatively poor African country, and the extent to which the strategy of the former can so easily trump the strategy of the latter. Rio Tinto sat on that for a long time. They're still sitting on it. They, they are ostensibly moving towards bringing Samandu into production, but we've seen deadlines before Zoom passed. The latest one has just slipped again. Um, Rio Tinto control, used to control the whole thing, now control half of it, southern half. The northern half was taken off them and given right. to Steinmetz's company. Um, BS, BSG G Resources, G to which Steinmetz is formally only an advisor, but he's also, it says in court papers, ultimately the, the main financial beneficiary, again, through layers of complex corporate ownership. Um, and the, it's another long story, but basically it was taken, a few months ago that um, Steinmetz's rights, BSGR's rights were cancelled on the grounds that a inquiry had concluded that um, bribes were paid and offered to the former dictator's wife to secure those rights. And it's now tied up in, I think, a seven or eight way legal battle um, involving a criminal case in Switzerland, yeah. a criminal case in the US, civil cases on t t uh, t three, possibly four continents. Um, and the prospect of something like that um, emerging into production is remote. And I'll just make two points about that. One is um, the mismatch between, and it was Mahmoud Tiam who put this to me, I think, who was, the, who was um, a minister about whom people have asked questions, but he was the minister under the junta of 2009, former UBS banker. Um, he has his critics, um, and he has people accusing him of all sorts of things, but he put it fairly reasonably when he said, within when the stock price of Rio Tinto or whoever else, Simando is reflected, um, it sits nicely in their equity as a future project, um, regardless of how sincere they are about developing it. Um, but obviously, there's no such benefit for Guinea. But this is also one of the situations where you have this kind of catch-22 economics, the IMF and others have, have examined the possibility of if Simandu went up to full production, the amount of money that would flow into the treasury would be massively destabilizing. And this is the problem. The prize that people look for is an enormous rush of rent money. And yet you look around all of Guinea's neighbors, and an enormous rush of rent money has been catastrophically damaging. Right. So just to finish, I mean, the, the, the analogy of, of sometimes found useful. And I thought, I thought I'd thought i made this up myself. It turns out it was in Steve Cole's book about Exxon first, but I'm, right. I'm going to claim it as myself, my own anyway. If, if I said to you, Tony, look, I know you've had a hard time. I know you've lost your job. I know there's a hole in the roof, um, lots of mouths to feed. I have a lottery ticket here for you, which is worth a million dollars. I can pretty much guarantee you, based on what we know happens to lottery winners, that you'll end up in rehab, you'll buy a fast car, and you'll crash it. 
you'll get divorced, everything will go wrong. And then you'll be broke. And then you'll be broke. But <laughs> you want it anyway, don't you? And everyone, of course, takes a lottery ticket. And, it's that, and that is the equivalent of, of bringing something, unless you're lucky, the lesson of the history of African resource states is by, almost exclusively, I would say, that if, when you have that rush of rent money, um, it's, it causes far more harm than good. Well, it's a good segue to my next question, or uh, sort of maybe a series of questions, is on the issue of, OK, uh, we've learned a lot of bad lessons, but there are some lessons that have been uh, examples of where it's worked well. I think uh, Chile has done well with its natural resources. Botswana certainly has done well. Uh, Namibia has done well. Uh, and so you know, there are examples of countries that, that have done better, and perhaps because of the peculiar institutional, or ethnic, or historical context of each of these countries. Uh, and I think the major actors have changed. Uh, I think the shell of 75 years ago is a different organization than it is now. Mm -hmm. uh, I think new actors such as Cosmos and, and maybe Tolo are, are perhaps taking a different look at how they're integrating their uh, activities into a more you know, holistic or helpful, uh, healthful way in, in to avoid some of these uh, pitfalls and, and uh, resource curse. Uh, manifestations that we've seen. Uh, you know, the question is, what does this pertain in the future? Do you think any of these initiatives like EITI, uh, the Kimberley process, which you discuss in your book, uh, make a difference? Do you think that the, the industry is changing? Do you think these relationships with the resource-rich countries are evolving to a new chapter? Lots of pressures on glo you know, localization, value addition, gl building global value chains, inter integrating infrastructure. Uh, to benefit larger communities or groups of, of uh, people. What is changing? I mean, the fact is that Africa has resources. Uh, the, the world now, east and west, need those resources. How can we avoid some of the uh, lessons or uh, pain from the past? And, and are there any institutional actors, such as EITI and um, uh, the Kimberley process, that might make this process better? Mm. So just nine questions. Sorry. You? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I just make a couple of points. One is, I'm so slightly wary of Chile, Botswana, and Namibia. These are also the countries at the top of the Gini coefficient list. Yeah, they're some yeah, of the most yeah. unequal countries in the world. But yes, much more peaceful for one thing than, than elsewhere. Um, um, on the things like EITI and the Kimberley process, I think they have some value. I think there's a danger with something like the EITI that um, it's backers become so keen for it to be all-encompassing that the bar to entry sinks a lot. I mean, there was that big test when they threw out Equatorial Guinea. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the very idea that Equatorial Guinea at the moment could have a stamp of legitimacy from an, organiza an international organization seems bizarre to me. Um, the Kimberley process similarly has achieved a lot, but I think took a big blow when they accredited Zimbabwean diamonds. I mean. Zim Zimbabwean diamonds flow onto the market. You can, um, you can buy a Zimbabwean diamond in Antwerp. You can probably buy one in New York. And at the same time, you can go to Marenge, as I did, and you can sit and you can hear people tell you how their brothers are being beaten right. to death in, a, in effectively a torture chamber run by yeah. the military. Um, diamond base. The diamond base. Yeah, a terif terrifying place. Um, uh, so I think possibly what's required is the one thing I should always say is that I, I never think I'm in any position to tell 48 countries what to do or even to begin to do anything like that. But I, I, I have tried to listen out to some of what I think are some of the most persuasive ideas. And I think one was, was repeatedly raised by Lamedo Sanusi when he was the central bank governor of Nigeria, widely held to be a very impressive man, now the Emir of Kano, of course, and the man who exposed the missing billions in, in Nigeria. He often talks about something that's kind of gone out of fashion and, and has lots of critics, but he, he basically looks at the Asian tigers. Um, and he sees that they used, as European countries did 200, 300 years ago, they protected their nascent industries. And they, they, they used, as South Africa, I think, is trying to do, they used a beneficiation strategy. You just lock those minerals up within your country, and you build up the, the value chain, rather as um, Botswana has done with the with cutting the and With the value addition and the cutting and sorting. and. Uh, polishing that they have now in country. I think that's the way, because I think fund for all these voluntary initiatives, fundamentally what needs to happen is that, um, to, to quote a guy who I mentioned in the book, who used to work with Tiny Roland, an extraordinarily affable Nigerian called Richard Akarelli. I mean, one late night, I asked him, what is the future of Africa? And he said, 
face fell and he just said, Africa will be a mine and Africans will be the drones yeah, of the world. I remember that, sorry. And this is, um, you know, this is not some sort of post-colonial casual racist. This is a Nigerian. Um, and it, that's a terrifying prospect for, for him and for, for a great many other people. So the way to break that, surely, is to move, broaden out these economies away from these enclaves of concentrated political and economic power into things like textile manufacturing, right. into things like cutting and polishing in Botswana or making catalytic converters out of platinum in down in Port Elizabeth. Right. Um, and the other thing is to enforce the law. I mean, there are very strong anti-corruption laws in the US. They're enforced pretty vigorously. There are new ones in the UK. There are very strong anti-corruption laws in Nigeria. There are new... Um, there are in places like Tanzania, which is obviously going to be crucial to watch, a place that has built some strong institutions and now has the, the test of oil and gas to come. There are initiatives there, such as ones where you have to demonstrate, rather than a, a prosecutor necessarily having to make the case that um, they can follow a money trail and can demonstrate um, that you've looted your ministry or taken a kickback, you would have to account for your lifestyle, effectively. So if there's an enormous and obvious difference between your lifestyle and your income, um, you would have to demonstrate where that extra... We call it the means out. test. Yeah, means test, but effectively, but kind of in reverse, right? So a means test on wealth rather than right. poverty. Um, so initiatives like that, I think, are interesting. And uh, the one, the last one I'd mentioned that is gathering steam is this campaign. It's made it into... Uh, the Obama administration has mentioned it, a kind of soft version. It's been mentioned at the G7, Global Witness and some other activists activist groups are getting behind it, and it's in the Labour manifesto in the UK, the, st the stronger version of it, is this idea of having a global registry of beneficial ownership, of, of true ownership of companies, of offshore companies, effectively, because there are already these registries of onshore companies. That, for me, would be an enormous change um, and would, would block off an awful lot of the plumbing of the, of the looting machine. It's through these secretive vehicles that again and again and again, you see these corrupt schemes uh, function. Well, uh, we have a, a great audience here, uh, so I'd like to take the remaining uh, 25 minutes of our time to uh, uh, open it up for questions from the floor. I'd like you to uh, uh, please identify yourselves and um, make your comments and statements reasonably short. So let's uh, open it up. Uh, Tiggy, are you ready or you want to wait? All right, she's still reading, so uh, questions? Okay, uh, Philip, we'll start with Philip. Thank you. I read the whole thing. Philip, you want, we got a microphone, we're being taped. Um, I was, and I, welcome I read, back. Thank you. Um, Michaela Rong's review in the New York Times said that, you know, this is a, a challenge to the sort of notion of Africa rising. Mm. So you've got these two sort of like versions of the African economy, you've got this, which is, you know, basically the bad guys, you know, making deals with the kleptocrats and then a huge mass of poor people. Um, and then, you know, the, the, my, my kind of question is really where are the Africans in your book? And, I, and the reason why I ask that question is because, mm. you know, if, if we were to say what's a political structure, let's, let's understand the political structure of Africa that we went to Somalia. Mm. And people would think, my God, this is... This is awful. And I mean, I know Steinmetz, I know Goethe, I know all of these guys. You've strung together some really awful characters who are very destructive overall um, in Africa. But I want to know, would you agree with Michaela's um, observation that this book challenges the notion that there's a new development phase underway in Africa? And, there, and there's two reasons why I say that, just very quickly, if you'll just give me the time. Um, I think, first of all, because Africa is not just a resource economy. Or the, the Africa rising, well, you put it aside, call it something else. That notion is really moving beyond resources, that we are seeing a great diversification in African economies, even in, even in Nigeria, where oil is down to 14% of GDP. So the real you know, kind of notion is one where you actually move beyond um, uh, the resource curve. And the secondly, the other thing is there's a huge dem demographic change in Africa where people are moving out of absolute poverty 
large numbers of people, and they're becoming active players, they're consumers, they're people that are of interest. So Africa is not just this you know, kind of wasteland of poverty. There's, there are people who are politically making a change, there are people who are you know, of interest to investors, not only because the investors want to come and dig stuff out of the ground and drill for oil. So it comes back to that original question. Do you see this as a, an alternative narrative, or can you incorporate that alternative view into what you're, what you're and, writing? And you thought my questions were complicated. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, Philip Van Niekerk, former editor of the uh, Mail and Guardian in South Africa, and one of the more experienced and esteemed uh, commentators on Africa for many, many years. For sure, for sure. Um, I, yes, I think, I think it is. Uh, not so much intended as a challenge to the Africa rising argument, but it's turned out like that. Um, I was personally always quite suspicious of the, that Africa rising argument, partly because it does something that I'm probably guilty of, although I tried to avoid it, of speaking as Africa as if it was one big thing. Um, and secondly, because I thought some of the excitement was overdone. Yes, there, 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 do seem to be, there does seem to be a growing middle class, but it's extremely fragile, I always thought. And I, I think that a big test comes now with a big fall in the commodity prices, the extent to which that African na rising narrative was driven by the, by the commodity boom. I'm, I don't think I'm in a bit of position to, to call how that will play out, but, I, but it'd be interesting to see what happens. On the... Um, on Africa rising being a sort of alternative, on, on, on the diversification of economies that we've seen being an alternative to the resource curse, I agree to some extent that in, certainly in places like Nigeria, places like Lagos, that are sort of managing to disconnect themselves from some, in some ways from that rentier economy. And in other pockets of largely coastal Africa, there is that development. But I think um, however much we would like those of us who, who, who who, who wish Africa as well as we possibly can, or would, would like to see this as a uniform development. Much of the interior of Africa, where I spent a lot of time, is not rising. It's still um, riven with warfare and extremely hard living conditions. Um, and on the diversification point, the, the crucial thing for me, the, the, the most insidious part, was not so much the share of resources in GDP, but the share of resources in government income. Because that, it was, and that, doesn't seem to be shifting that much. So in Nigeria, it's still kind of 70% government income from oil and gas and about 4% from direct taxation. And in Sudan, the figures like South Sudan, it's 98%, it's a similarly high rate in, in Angola. That, that for me was more, more troubling, really, because that, um, it breaks that basic contract between rulers and ruled. It means that in many ways, the, the ruling elite of whatever form it takes doesn't need to appeal for popular consent to rule because it's not funded by the, by the people. But I, I mean, I don't know if you wanted to come, come back again. I mean, I think it's a strong point. Uh, other questions, please. Right. Later, OK. He's going to corner you on the way out. No, please, please do. I mean, yeah, I don't yeah. pretend to have answers. So Good don't. afternoon. My name is Rosemary Seguera. I'm a president of a nonprofit organization called Hope for Tomorrow. We focus on conflicts and violence prevention. Uh, you talk about looting machines. Looting machines have caused a lot of havoc, not only looting, but violence and conflicts in Africa. Women have died, children have died looking for those uh, minerals, oil, and everything. Now that you have written this book, what do you think you can make a difference of your book and uh, part of what you are selling this book should go back to those countries and help those women and children to make a difference so that the looters can know that there is this man really wrote a book of truth now that uh, you've written the book. So how do you make that change? Uh, or you, are, you will be part of the looter again. So... <laughs> so Thank you. First of all, I'd like to say there's a, 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 <laughs> there's a, there's a, there's a, a slightly mistaken premise at the start, of, at the center of your point up here, which is that the idea that the book's going to make any money. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, I mean, yeah, no, I mean, I, personally, I do try and do some charitable stuff, but I'm not going to get into it here, but we can talk about it afterwards. Um, we have a question down here, and uh, let's take a couple. Let's do here, here, 
there, and then we'll come back for one quick last round. Dieter, I got you, and I'm going to give Tiggy at least one more chance to ask yeah, a question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm Jeff Wilkins. I benefited from a uh, uh, first run of a discussion of this book at the Columbia University Law Conference on Africa last Saturday, where I met Tom. Uh, being South African, I, of course, uh, but I work, have worked for the World Bank for 40 years, so I, 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 but I have lived recently in Cape Town and grew up in Johannesburg, and I have some knowledge of the South African economy. And the question that has struck my mind is South African mining companies have been through the same world down shocks and, and uh, uh, the collapse of oil of commodity prices. Yet some of the companies don't seem to have been subject to state capture, either by, say, the military wing of the ANC uh, when it came to power or by Chinese investment. It just doesn't seem that way. They've got many other problems in South Africa, but not the same as what you describe in your book. Am I deluding myself on that? And, and if I'm right, or partly right, could it attribute it that there's better corporate law and transparency mm -hmm. there and internationally owned companies that are quoted on the international stock exchanges, such as Anglo Gold Ashanti and these big companies that uh, they've got social problems, but they don't seem to have the state capture rental issue that you describe so eloquently in the book. Okay. Yeah. Take um, that and bring it back to the next one. But go ahead. Do, yeah, do you you can take a no, go ahead. Go ahead and answer. I we'll mean, just, just quickly. I've, um, there isn't a no great deal on South Africa in the book, but I would say, obviously, they were subject to state capture under apartheid. Right, right, right. Um, and, I mean, which is the, obviously the biggest sweep of the bigger period I'm trying to cover in modern South African history in, in the book. And the, going, going, going back through the, the numbers, the, the extent to which the, the international gold market was the bankroller of apartheid is just astounding if you go back through the numbers. I, I think it was the late... Yeah. The late 70s, early 80s, when, when um, South Africa was producing two-thirds of world gold production. And um, that's what kept apartheid afloat. And there, there were obviously there were tensions between um, the kind of the Afrikaans political side and the more English-speaking mining execs generally. Um, but they, they made their, their tacit arrangement that the, the one would support the other. Um, are, so the question is, are, are South African companies, big South African mining companies today subject to less state capture? I think broadly so, yeah. I think the JSC is a pretty strong institution. South Africa is a broader, <coughs> a broader economy. My one point would be that um, the sort of inequality indicators haven't really changed, have they, since 1994. I, for me, part of that is a model that's obviously next to impossible to, to, in such a short period of time, to make redress on the scale that's required. But um, part of the problem, I think, is especially in the early stage of black economic empowerment, was just basically transferring sources of rent. Um, so keeping the, a, a pyramid that was shaped by as a resource economy, even though it is now broader, and just changing the color of some of the bricks at the top, rather than trying to widen out the yeah. pyramid. It's a good book to read on that topic is Steve Lewis's The Economics of Apartheid. And the reason that Botswana left the RAND Monetary Union in 1976 was in part because they felt that the diamond sales were in effect accruing to the benefit of the Reserve Bank of South Africa. And so Steve Lewis's recommendation to Kwet Masiri at that time, who was the Minister of Finance, was let's exit the RAND Monetary Union and that way we'll be, we'll, we'll, we won't be subsidizing apartheid. And in a way, you know, Botswana did that and did that successfully. Uh, we got a question back there, and then we'll come over uh, to Jennifer and then Tiggy. Uh, hi, Winslow Robertson, Cowries and Rice, China, Africa, consulting stuff. Um, I'm really curious about the prospects of dismantling the looting machine. And I track Chinese finance in Africa, and I don't particularly blame Chinese money in Africa doing what any other foreign country does in Africa, but I want to know um, yeah, what the prospects are for the, the looting machine to stop the incentive structures that might change, and whether you have a brilliant 10-point plan to stop it in the co <laughs> concluding chapter of your book. My brilliant 10-point plan? I'll read it to you now. Um, no, I have no such thing. Um, I think we touched on some of it earlier. I think there are, there are things that the... I think it was more in the UK, actually, when I was doing events like this, the number of people who would, who would steer the conversation back to aid um, and the, the extent to which in the British 
central and right-wing press, aid dominates the discussion of Africa. I, I, I wonder whether an interesting thing would be to switch more to the scale of wealth that is um, filched from Africa and bleeds out either through straight-up corruption, through transfer mispricing, um, or you could argue just, just through raw exports as opposed to more value addition and manufacturing within the, the, the continent, the big resource producers. Um, I think a shift in the debate like that would be, would be helpful. I think sometimes the, the debate, especially, especially I think you find it in Europe, is obsessed with aid, which is a fraction of this, of the, the sums we're talking about, and often terribly paternalistic and neocolonial. And um, it seems to me often that the debate is, it's the equivalent of headbutting someone, standing on their neck, and then saying, I'll, I'll call you an ambulance. I mean, the, 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 the structures of the looting machine are overwhelmingly, the plumbing is overwhelmingly outside Africa, and it's in, um, it falls under the regulatory, re, falls beyond the regulatory power of, of um, African institutions. <coughs> um, and the other thing, yeah, the, the beneficial ownership thing, I think, would be, would be one concrete step, but I, know I don't have some big solution. That's, that's from, surely that's for people like you to work out. Jennifer? <laughs> with CSIS, and thanks for the talk. It was actually following on that, um, the question of um, the, the G7 initiative on tax transparency and beneficial ownership, and Kofi Annan had his, uh, the Africa Progress Panel, very good report a couple years ago, equity in, in yeah. extractives. Yeah, equity in extractives, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Um, but I just wonder, what kind, of, what kind of traction is that initiative getting, and what is the venue in which to push into to push that, and what kind of traction is it getting in Africa, um, kind of global or regional or sta standards for beneficial ownership? I mean, what, yeah. what will get that done kind of thing? Where is the place to push on that? One answer to that is to say, read JR's report when it comes out soon. Um, two, it, I'm not sure about traction in Africa. About I mean, it's not really an African, pro it's, it's not really an African problem, right? Well, you do, um, yes. Um, I think Thabo Mbeki's report on trade mispricing is linked into that because it's, a, it's the same vehicles that are used for um, tax dodges. Um, I think, though, that also people, and this is all just anecdotal, really, from, from me on, on this stuff for now, but um, a lot of people in the, in the various talks along the road um, have pointed to that recent New Yorker, the New York Times piece called The Towers of Secrecy, all about um, real estate development in Manhattan and how, I think it was something like 90% of new um, construction in Manhattan is owned by offshore companies. And I suspect that people will start to twig to this kind of stuff much more if they, th if they can combine a sense of empathy with far off countries that are being looted with the fact that their children can't afford to buy a house because a lot of looted Russian money or Nigerian money or whatever it may be is massively inflating the, the real estate market. They might own Rockefeller Center, but they can't get a house, right? In their own yeah, yeah, right, yeah. I, I think that's where maybe some of it will, will come from. This, um, a, a woman I spoke to earlier at Global Witness, they're doing some, some work to try to raise the profile of it. Um, the UK election, if it goes Labour's way, would be interesting to see how that plays out. I think, I think the main division is between those who say we must have a registry, it must be global, and it must be public. And those who say, yeah, well, we'll try and have a registry, country by country, but it'll be private, which rather defeats the point. It would be, it would be available to kind of law enforcement agencies and maybe one or two others. Um, but it has, to, it has to be the first option, surely, for it to, to stand any chance. We're going to have two more questions. I got, OK, JR, you want to make a comment on, on that? Yeah, go ahead. And then I'm going to do with Deirdre, and I'm going to leave the last word to my good friend, Tiggy. Sure. Yeah, first, just a compliment to the book, Tom. I just finished it. And you know, in addition to- Can you tell to, us who you are, JR? Uh, JR Maley, Africa Center for Strategic Studies. You know, in addition to kind of mapping out the elite level networks and the John le Carre type uh, storylines, you know, what I was struck by was the ability for, uh, uh, to convey the sort of on the ground level storyline. Uh, the particular passage I'm thinking of is the, it's for, get, forbidden to piss in the park uh, chapter where you uh, discuss uh, stopping to relieve yourself on the side of the road and turn that into an eloquent discussion of how patronage network work. Um, 
You know, and that, what that struck me was, you know, getting down to the ground level. If you were a reformer, if you were someone in civil society, if you were, you know, someone who really wanted to make a difference in a resource-rich African country like Angola or like Eastern Congo, you know, we talk about how the plumbing is outside of the continent. What would you do if you were in one of those countries and you wanted to make a difference? I mean, the trial of Raphael Marx de Moraes is this week. I mean, he's one of the most renowned anti-corruption campaigners on the continent. And he's facing something like 16 libel charges. Mm -hmm. you know, so what pathways are there for folks in Africa, in resource-rich states, to sort of make a difference? And where, you know, where can people start if they want to get move the needle a little bit? Thanks. Um, thanks, man. Um, do we, do I do that one or take? Why don't we take a couple? Uh, Deirdre, you go next, and then I'll leave the last one for Tiggy. Yeah, uh, Tom, my name is Deirdre Lupin. And, uh, I've been a correspondent of Tom's for quite a long time on Nigeria and Africa in general, and it's Absolutely, such a pleasure yeah, a, a to see him today. Sort of yeah, lovely. Uh, I must confess I haven't read the book yet, but I very proudly own now an autographed copy, so I'm delighted. Um, my question uh, is a very hard and naive question all at the same time. In your investigations of Nigeria, um, have you come to any conclusions about why no one will tackle or is willing and able to tackle the massive oil theft in the Niger Delta? Oh, uh, OK. Can we take one more while I try and work out what Tiggy, uh, I'm going to say yeah. to that? <laughs> Tiggy, I'm afraid we're going to have to see him later. Go ahead, Tiggy. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Did it take you two hours to get here? Well, yes. <laughs> I hope it doesn't take you two hours to go home. <laughs> All right, I'll give, you, I'll give you a last word, but so, it's going to have to be short, okay? For me, it would be both a comment and a question. Yeah. So I will Tiggy, say, when you tell us who you are. Oh, my name is Tiggy Kamara. I am the founder and CEO of Tiggy Mining Group. So this book actually hits right back home uh, regarding the mining sector in Guinea. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Simandu... Uh, case has had like <coughs> good and bad impact on the mining sector in Guinea. Good one that the government has finally taken steps about trying to uh, face people that they think are not doing things the right way. Mm. People that are looting, like you said, Africa or uh, you know our economy in the certain review, ways. The review of past contracts. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But mm. the other part is. It's not just putting it out there. It's not just attacking one uh, particular company, because I'm sure there are many other companies in Africa, specifically in Guinea, that have acquired licenses, major companies or major licenses, but not doing nothing. You know, just sitting on there and then making money. Mm -hmm. But the impact that it has, the negative impact for like someone like me, in the junior mining company, it has made it like very, very difficult for us, for example, to find the right type of partners because all of a sudden they think, oh, the government now is not really, um, they're not protecting interest. They have big companies like, uh, you know, Valet and then BHP and so forth. All of a sudden now they could take their licenses. So what will they do to us little investors, you know? So the most important thing was to to find the way to sending out the message. And I think it was the way the message was sent that is now right. Because if we go a little bit deeper, somewhere they will say, this was not only about looting uh, Guinea's economy. Somewhere they were saying that it was something that was between Benny Stenmez and Mr. S Soros, or whoever his name is. You know, so it was something, it was like a, a personal vendetta. And then poor Guinea is caught in the middle of it. And, then, and with that, all the different companies that really want to develop the economy. Mm -hmm. So having done so many research, what type of advice will you give African government in about how now to remedy to this, uh, to this kind of a um, looting program? What, yeah. can, what can it be done? I think we'll let you go ahead with those. Um, Maybe in reverse order. Yeah. yeah. Um, so obviously, the, the BSGR's approach from the beginning when it realized it was under review has been to try to push a completely alternative narrative, which is a conspiracy between Alpha Conde, George Soros, uh, assorted other people, um, 
w for which, from what I've seen, I don't believe is the case. Um, uh, there, there, there doesn't seem to have been a, a, a significant body of evidence to show that that is what really happened. It's it, the, the, what appears to have happened, I think, is what you're arguing, is that they, Condé, to a greater or lesser extent, made a genuine attempt to have an independent or at least an arm's length review of past mining contracts, exactly the kind of thing that any sort of policy advisor, I think, would, would, would advise in that situation when you've had half a century of dictatorship. Um, there were flaws in how it was done, it seems, and it, lots of critics, but they, they seem to have made a pretty good effort of it, especially when you compare it to something like the Congolese mining review, yeah, which did seem to be a, an exercise in asset snatching. Um, uh, so I think it's a tricky one for me to comment on because we've done so much reporting on it. Um, and we're trying, you know, we try to try to keep that balance all the way through. But I think a lot of people would say that Conde deserves some credit for that for that process, whatever other criticisms there may be of the way he's ruled. Um, but it just shows that I completely agree. It just shows the um, the terrible bind that if you like, if you if he hadn't done anything like that, it would have been encouraging impunity and da 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 da. da. And if you go ahead with something like that, you're an asset snatcher and, yeah. and what have you. It's, uh, yeah, I'm not sure there is. Uh, that's just an injustice. <laughs> I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I don't know if you have an idea, but I'm not entirely sure how that would be, how better to address that. They had their PR people. They tried to get their message across. Um, they had some pretty heavyweight advisors trying to help them. I think, I think, by and large, the message has got across that certainly compared to the junta that went immediately before, Things, things are better in Guinea, but it has been, it has been ensnared in this big legal battle. It's not there. Yeah. You know, the mining sector right now is like, for me, someone that really knows the mining sector, and they're doing this for me, it's like, every day we have a new laws coming from everywhere, we don't know where to start. Yeah. We need to start. If these people really want to help, it's the time that they, they come up with one solution and we stick to that. We cannot come with one now and then two months later do another one. Uh, we don't know where we're going. So we started off right, you know, with good intentions, but now we are lost in the middle of something. We don't even know what Well, in an environment of declining commodity prices, too. So it, it's like... And Ebola. Yeah, I mean, and Ebola. Some, some pretty unlucky cards as well were dealt there, which is beyond anyone's control. Well, I think the two of you can continue this discussion. Shall I just jump on the other Deirdre two? and JR's pieces, and I think, unfortunately, we're going to have to clear the room. This, um, I think this comes back to um, something that was mentioned earlier about where are the Africans in this book. Um, uh, there are quite a lot of them, um, and, but I think the, the, the question was more to do with where are the kind of the Africans who aren't the finance minister, right, or the... the, the people you might bump into at a roadblock in Eastern Congo. And um, that's something I did try to, to grapple with, of, of what it's like to live under this kind of, um, a sort of political economy that's distorted by, by rent. And it's, again and again, I did, you, you, just see, you could see this tension almost physically in people, um, especially when I was living in, in Lagos or down in the Niger Delta, of people who would, like that guy on that roadblock with his AK-47, who would, who clearly be aware that their um, their actions, their, their 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 imposition in that case of a kind of basically bogus roadblock to, to tax a little piece of the road, um, were were part of a broader malaise in someone like Congo or the Delta that that is perpetuating the curse for their children ultimately. But you're faced with this terrible dilemma of do you make your peace with the system or stay locked outside and stay locked outside the one kind of, to take your point, not across Africa, but in, in many of these resource areas, the one real pocket of, of wealth. Um, for on what to do, um, hip hop, I would say. Um, so Raphael, you mentioned in Angola, he's written about Exprosivo Mental and other rappers in Angola, this kind of vanguard of resistance. Um, there are some LD and other very interesting Nigerian uh, rappers and musicians who are starting to articulate in a, um, a fascinating way um, the, 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 at least the anger 
uh, with the with the the kind of oil trap that they found themselves stuck in. There's links between the um, the uprising in the, the the coup basically in Burkina Faso and and hip hop and Sierra Leone and the anti corruption movement in Senegal and the protection of the democratic process. So I would say if you want to make a different difference, learn to rap. Um, and I think the Nigerians invented that approach a few years ago. Didn't finally, they? well, Femi I mean, it works. Right it now. works here. Huh? Yeah. Um, and why is oil still stolen in the Niger Delta? Um, because you keep running the racket, did you? Um, because in a sentence, I think the worrying thing is that there's weirdly an alignment of interests. It suits the, I'm not sure it's necessarily always conscious, but it suits the interests of the multinationals operate, and increasingly the local Nigerian companies operating onshore in the Delta for some chunk of that oil to be stolen. It's an informal version for me of a, like a formal local content policy. Um, right. Everybody says that they're losing, but actually the, all those, those key interests, formal, informal, violent, nonviolent, are um, their interests are aligned. Look, um, there's a lot of uh, things in this book that we haven't reached, including the personal toll that this took on your, on your own life and how you had to recover from an extraordinarily intense period of time. Uh, but I'd like to uh, welcome you back another time. Uh, wish you much success, continued success with this book. Uh, I know that you're a young man on to great things and hope that we'll cross paths again. So will you join me in uh, giving Tom a, a round of applause? Thank you.